Does anybody have any questions over anything you've looked at, read, done? Lectured about? No? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We shall see. Owls were no problem then? No. They were due yesterday? They were long, but I mean, they weren't bad. Okay. Nobody so had any questions about any of them? Any more explanation? All right. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's go. This more is just information. You guys, who's had physics or is in physics? So those of you who have had physics you will recognize that equate or the unit for energy from physics class. In physics, you call it joule. We're going to call it joule because that's its name. Um, we're generally going to be dealing in units uh, units that are large, like kilocal or kilojoules. Um, but the joule is the base unit. You just throw on a prefix. Second bullet I give you, actually, yeah, the second bullet I give you in case you run into any problems or examples that involve a unit of calorie. The calorie was the, you know, back in the 18, mid 1800s, 1850 or so, when <coughs> energy was very first explained. Uh, they called it the calorie. Uh, Calor meaning energy. I give you those conversions in case you need them. One thing to keep in mind just for your knowledge is that uh, our dietary calories are a capital C calorie, which technically means a kilocalorie. Okay? Go to any other country in this world and they're going to say kilocalories on their packaging, not calories. So our calorie is actually a thousand calories. Okay, um, these next two we will use more in class next time. Um, has anybody done the first set of vowels for this chapter six? Is it not focused or is it what? It was just, it had you cut off. So I just, I zoomed it back out so that it would get you. Thank you. And now it's just like really far away <coughs> from you, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you saw a finger and that was it. But I think that's a little much. Anna Lee is going to be disappointed with this video. So, is it still recording? Yep. Okay. Alright. <laughs> Um, so specific heat, if you want to heat something up, it's going to require a certain amount of energy. Now, specific heat and heat capacity, both of those are used to calculate how much energy required to change a temperature. Either adding energy if you want to raise the temperature or removing energy if you want to lower the temperature. Specific heat is used for pure substances. so. I have my piece of lead here, <coughs> pure substance. If I wanted to raise the temperature of this piece of lead by two degrees, I could go through and plug in say, how much does that piece of lead weigh? Look up what its specific heat is. So this is a con the C here is a constant that you would look up in a table. <coughs> Delta T is the change in temperature. I'm going to assume everybody knows what the Triangle means? Yeah. Okay. So delta T is going to be the temperature final minus the temperature initial. And for the, with the exception of one thing that we do, anything that we do as a change in is always going to be a final minus initial calculation. I don't know what the triangle means, but I, I can guess that prime means change. Yep. Q 
represents heat or the amount of energy that's going to be uh, required to do that temperature change. Um, this equation and this one, both are basically just plug and chugs. They have specific uh, places where they're used, but they really are just plug in and solve for the variable that's not known. Now, the thing that makes heat capacity difference, different is that it's for stuff that's not pure. Um, and it really is just kind of very, very, very specific to the thing that you're talking about. So if I wanted to know what, how much energy it would take to raise the temperature of these scissors one degree Celsius, I could find a heat capacity for it. Now the reason why we don't have a, a, a thing to go look it up is because this, these scissors would have a different heat capacity than another pair of scissors because they're going to be slightly different. Um, but the reason why we don't have, or the reason why we need a different value is because these scissors are made up of multiple materials. We've got the metal blades, we've got the plastic handles, uh, we've got the screw here to, that's holding the two parts together. So it's got multiple pieces, each one of which is going to have a different amount, a, a different specific heat. So the plastic itself would be considered pretty much a pure substance. We could find the specific heat of this plastic. The metal, uh, the scissors themselves, the blades, <coughs> we could find a specific heat for that metal. Uh, I'm sure that the screw is a different version or different type of metal. It would have its own specific heat. So be because this thing's made up of multiple materials, we don't have one specific value that we could use. We would just have a heat capacity. So heat capacity is used when, you're uh, when you have something that you know the amount of energy, but it's not something you're measured a mass of. I could find the heat capacity of this calculator. I could find the heat capacity of this label printer, this book. Okay. We could find the heat capacity of this room. And if I define the room and everything that is in it, there is going to be a specific amount of energy that would be required to raise the temperature of everything in this room one degree Celsius. So <clears throat> this morning, temperature in here was hovering right around 21 degrees Celsius, which is a little bit warm. I don't know why. But uh, it usually hovers right around 18, or I'm sorry, not 18, 20 degrees Celsius. So it raised over the weekend one degree Celsius. I'm not sure if it's cooled back down now or not. But everything in the room, for the most part, when I walked in this morning, was going to be at the same temperature. Questions? Again. These we'll use more next time in class. Mr. Okay. Yeah. Can you remind us what a big C is for the second equation? Uh, that's the heat capacity. So <coughs> the little C would be on this one is going to be a value you look up. The big C is similar it's going to be a value associated with that piece of equipment or whatever it is that you want to know what the heat capacity is. It doesn't have a mass part of it because you're not going to measure it as a ratio. It's just how much heat is it going to take to raise the temperature of that thing. <clears throat> Most of the time, so <clears throat> if I wanted to know how much temperature it took to raise the temperature of this calculator, it would be pretty, be pretty safe to say that most all calculators that are of the same brand you know, and model would have a really, really similar heat capacity. The only thing different in them would be like the batteries. Okay. okay. So in middle school, 
you guys learned about kinetic energy and potential energy, and you pretty much just stuck to potential energy being the energy that you could have for motion. Yeah, is that about right? You didn't talk much about other, other energies, correct? You might talk about light energy, but you didn't talk about potential light energy. Physics, <coughs> those of you who have had physics, when you talk about potential and kinetic energy, that's again, you're talking about the potential kinetic energy. You don't usually talk about the potential chemical energy. That's our focus. Now, we're going to be using kinetic energy. And <coughs> as the diagram here on the bottom is showing, we can exchange or we can transfer, transform potential kinetic energy, or I'm sorry, potential chemical energy into kinetic energy, and vice versa. Another form of potential energy that's important in chemistry but is not going to be our focus is the potential energy due to a phase. So like going from a solid to a liquid, or what state is it? There's a certain amount of potential energy due to what state that material exists in. Okay. Questions so far? Yes. Why are there different kinds of potential energy? Like why can't it just be potential energy? In the big scheme of things, they're all the same. Because if you go back and look at the units, the kilograms, meters squared per second squared, they're all the same unit. For us, it's, it's basically a difference in what you're studying and changing. So, Physics, you're studying, your, your potential energy is based on the position of the object for the most part relative to where can it move. If you think of all the other potential energies, they kind of fall into that category. So for us, um, our potential kinetic energy or potential chemical energy would be like in methane. I've got those <coughs> four hydrogens singly bonded to that carbon. There's a certain amount of energy associated with that. Now, how those bonds can change and rearrange, so if I, you know, add an oxygen in there, so the chemical bond, the double bond there between the oxygen atoms, there's a certain amount of energy associated with that as well. they have the potential to undergo a chemical reaction to form carbon dioxide and water. Now, I don't have it balanced, but you get the idea. We're just, we're shifting or moving the elements around. So, I get, one way of thinking about it is, it's just a different way of looking at its positions. What are they associated with? In this case, though, we've got the added you know, I guess layer, it's not just where they're located, but how strong are the attractions? You know, what kind of attraction is it? And that's what the potential is for us. How are they arranged? What is the attraction between them? How strong is that attraction before and after? That's where our potential is, okay? But in the big scheme of things, energy is energy. It's just how is it exhibiting itself. Now, uh, we're going to revise this a little bit as we go. But the internal energy of a system is our kinetic and potential energy total. So. <coughs> If I had a, you know, if I had a balloon 
with methane and oxygen in it. They have the potential to turn into carbon dioxide and water. So we've got that energy, but we also have those molecules in there moving around. So our total internal energy is going to be that sum of both of these. That's important because we also have laws we have to follow, law conservation of energy. So the total amount of energy we have between our potential and kinetic energy, that has to be accounted for. It has to be, it, our, the total has to be the same as the reaction is taking place. Questions about the definitions so far? Because those of you who read, that's pretty much what section one was, right? Just laying out definitions and, and stuff. <coughs> so no questions? All right. I just made a universe. I'm calling that my universe. In this universe, I have a system. all the other stuff in my universe. The surroundings. So a universe is going to equal the surroundings plus the system. Now the reason why we make we need to make a distinction between the two is because the system is what we're going to define it as our chemical equations and chemical reactions. It's what's changing that we are trying to study. Now, it's useful to think of, you know, to try and simplify things as much as possible. And one of the things we're going to see <coughs> next time in class with a thing called calorimetry is we need to try and simplify all the energy changes that are going to occur. And saying that a universe is inside of a little coffee cup, that's going to be helpful. Because then we don't have to worry about all the other stuff. So <coughs> when we talk about a system, it's got to be a well-defined thing. And for us, that's going to be the chemical reaction that takes place. So my system, I'm going to use methane. Crap, keep writing it too. This would be my system. All the molecules that are involved in that chemical reaction, that's going to be my system. They're going to undergo, obviously, we're going to start off with the methane and the oxygen. And they're un going to undergo chemical change and we're going to get new compounds, carbon dioxide, and water. And that's going to involve an energy change. And how the energy ch is exchanged between the system and the surroundings is very specific. Questions?
guys are boring today. No, not always. Okay. So, <coughs> all of the data that I have on the screen here is representing the system. This is the temperature of the system. This is the amount of potential energy that the system has. This is the amount of kinetic energy that the system has. It doesn't matter what the system is. I'm just saying, this is my system, this is the amount of kinetic potential, and what its temperature is. Oh, no, I'm good. Okay, I thought you had a question. No, no, no. Now, <clears throat> when a process takes place, when a reaction takes place, we are going to change the potential energy. And as a result of that potential energy, we are going to change the kinetic energy. If we change the kinetic energy, we must change the temperature. Because what is temperature a measure of? The average kinetic energy. And throwing that average on there is really important. So, in this, my potential energy is going to rise. The kinetic energy is going to decrease. What's going to happen to the temperature? Decreases. What? The temperature will decrease. Why? Because there's less kinetic energy. There's going to be less kinetic energy. I'm going to change kinetic energy into potential energy. Because temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy, if this is going to drop, my temperature is going to drop. Is everybody OK? My kinetic energy dropped by 20. The potential energy rose by? 20. So we've got our law of conservation of energy covered. So our kinetic energy has been transferred into potential energy. We see that we have a decrease in the temperature. Now, I know I started the temperature and the kinetic energy both at 30, but I didn't mean for them to be like step for step. Is that what you're going to ask about? I was asking if there's like an equation to determine the loss of temperature due to the kinetic energy. No, and that's, there's several factors that go into that. Okay. So <clears throat> it kind of goes back to the specific heat. How much energy does it take to change the temperature of a material? So take for the lead, for example. The amount of energy it's going to take per gram to change the lead is much lower than if it was uh, water. Water is one of, those, it's one of those weird substances. It requires a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. It's why it's used as a, you know, a uh, uh, a heat sink, if you wish. Um, I mean, large corporations, Google, Microsoft, uh, companies like that, Amazon, they're, start, they're, they're researching and starting to put their servers underwater. Why? Because underwater, you got all this water to dissipate the heat that's being produced by the servers. Um, if you if you don't know what I mean by a server room being warm, the bathroom down by Milligan's room, that closet is a janitor's closet, but it also has a bunch of servers in it. If you go, I think if you go feel that door, it's a little bit warmer than what you would expect. Um, 
there's a couple other rooms around the school like that as well. <coughs> but you don't require nearly as much electricity because you've got that cooling from the water. So how much the temperature is going to change does depend on, one, how much energy is going to be given off or absorbed by our, temp our kinetic energy change, but also what is the material? Is it something that's going to be easy to change the temperature, meaning it's not going to take as much energy to change the temperature a lot? So there's several factors that go into that. It's not an easy, just one-off equation that you can apply to anything. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah? When it says kinetic energy, is that the average kinetic energy? Like, yes. So why wouldn't the temperature and kinetic energy be the same? If temperature is just average. So There's a, okay, so there's a difference between the kinetic energy that all of the molecules have in total for the sum of all their kinetic energies versus the average individually. So when we're measuring the temperature, what we're doing is we're saying, on average, if I picked out a molecule, we would expect it to be moving at X velocity. Because, you know, kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So if I picked one molecule, it's going to have a velocity. Its velocity should be, on average, you know, what the bulk sample is. What this is measuring is the total amount of kinetic energy that all of the molecules have sum. So that's why they're not going to be the same value. <coughs> so temperature is going to be the measure of the average of any one particle. This is measuring the sum of all the kinetic energies that you have. Other questions? That's a good question. I might need to... I don't want to waste my time. They didn't ask about it. I'm not going to go back and do it. Okay. So, that's my system. Now, because I created a universe, let's say that I can control the flow of energy between the system and surroundings and say, don't allow any kind of energy change to take place between the system and surroundings until I say so. So, we have our system. Our reaction has taken place, whatever reaction it is. In this case, our temperature inside the system went down. That's because our kinetic energy decreased, our potential energy went up. Now let's say that the temperature in the surroundings was equal to 30 degrees Celsius before the reaction took place. And in this example, the temperature of my system. 30 degrees Celsius before the reaction took place. Reaction takes place and my temperature changes to 23 degrees Celsius. Now, what I'm saying right now is that energy can't transfer between the system and surroundings. So right now, we have a system, after that reaction has taken place, 
at 23 degrees Celsius, and we have surroundings still at 30. Everybody, find a place on the table where you have not been leaning and put your hand. What does it feel? Cold. Feels cool. Doesn't feel like about 20 degrees Celsius. That's what it is. Now, why does it feel cool? Why does it feel cool? What? Because we're hotter. Because you're hotter? Yeah. Okay, let's use a, let's use a better term. You got more heat? No, you do not have more heat. You'll understand why I say that emphatically soon enough. Go ahead. A higher temperature? You're at a higher temperature. And if you have two things at different temperatures, what's going to happen? Irving? It like transfers. From where to where? From like your body to like table area. Okay, but from what energy from higher temperature to the lower temperature? So you're going to get a transfer of energy from you into the table because you're at a higher temperature, temp the table is a lower temperature. When will that stop? When you reach an equilibrium, when the temperature of your hand and the temperature of the table are are the same. Now, <coughs> you guys come into this classroom after lunch, so the room has been empty for a good 35 minutes. When you come in and sit in the chairs, do the chairs feel cool? Because nobody's been sitting in them, right? Do you feel, does the chair still feel cool to you now? No. no, because you probably got to a thermal equilibrium where the amount of energy that's going into the chair is the same as the amount of energy going from the chair into you. Not saying you're at the same temperature because your temperature is gonna be higher than what that chair's temperature is, but they're gonna be close. You're not gonna notice it anymore, okay? So, <coughs> Because our system is at a lower temperature after this reaction is taking place than our surroundings, we're going to get an energy transfer. And this is kind of this is why I said you're, you don't have more heat. Because heat shows up when only when you have a temperature difference. So our term for heat is going to be the energy change. I know it's not on here because it's on our slide, but it was brought up. Our definition <coughs> for heat is a change in energy that occurs due to a temperature difference. Something cannot contain heat. I know people th talk about heat storage. You can't contain heat. You can, you can have something at a higher temperature, but you cannot contain or store heat. Uh, when I touch the table here, even though it's colder than me, are there still energies going from the table to me? No. So all of the energy is just going to go to the table? Correct. Correct. Because it's, it's always a flow from higher temperatures to the lower temperature. Kyla? So is heat just a unit of measurement? No, it's an actual it's an actual uh, energy. It's just not an energy that you can contain. I know it's weird. It, it's one of those things. It's we've you you've used the word heat incorrectly for so long. It's one of those things to, it's hard to get over. It's kind of like, there's no hot or cold. There's a higher temperature or a lower temperature, but there's no hot, there's no cold. 
heat. You can get an, a, you can have an extremely large change in heat at extremely low temperatures because heat's going to be heat's measured in joules. It's just a result of having a difference in temperatures. So if I had, for example, if I had um, <coughs> something at 20 Kelvin and 10 Kelvin, that's really stinking cold. I mean, zero Kelvin's absolute zero. Room temperature here right now is about 293 Kelvin. So this is really stinking cold. If I had two substances, one at 20 and one at 10 Kelvin, energy is going to flow from the 20 Kelvin to the 10 Kelvin. And let's say they met in the middle at 15 Kelvin. All right. I have 300 Kelvin and 290 Kelvin. So same materials, I just have them closer to room temperature. If I had the same materials, same temperature difference, let's say they're the same mass, do you know what my temperature is going to be? So if I have 300 Kelvin and I get 290 Kelvin, I bring them together, do you know what the temperature is going to be? 295. What's 295. It's going to be the same heat transfer, the same energy transfer in the form of heat at this low temperature as it is at this higher temperature, simply because they're the same materials at the same temperature gradients or difference. So when we talk about heat, the amount of heat is just simply a measure of how much energy gets transferred. Kind of goes back to that equation with That equation right there. How much energy is it going to take to change the temperature of it? <coughs> In this case, it's a temperature change. It doesn't matter what the temperature is, it's the temperature difference that we're looking at. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. I know it's weird. But again, it's because you guys are, you've used incorrectly the term heat. John? Okay, so slowly once the temperature starts to rise back up in the system, because the surrounding gets higher than the system. And that's where we're getting to. Oh, okay. And then I also had a question. So if the surroundings is lower than the temperature of the system, is it just work in a vice versa way? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that's what everything's once you've got a foundation for what the definitions are, direction is just op everything just turns opposite. And we use that, we just use a sign. It's either positive or negative. So the sign's going to tell us our direction. Okay, so heat is just the measure of energy that's being transferred? It's the amount of energy being transferred as a result of there being a temperature difference between two things. Are we able to think about this? Like, I'm thinking more of like an applied way. So like lightning, like in the atmosphere, like, or not the atmosphere, but like when you see lightning, would that be a I guess, um, or would that be technically like the system in the surroundings? The system in that, that's a hard system to define. <coughs> So lightning is, I'm going to say, I'm going to pass on that because lightning is actually a different form of potential energy okay. change. All right. So <laughs> what, did you guys, how much electricity did you guys cover last year in physics? Before you had to, before we had to ditch it. I think that's the unit that we were in. I believe that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that the current test? 
Oh wait, actually, we were in current. Yeah, no, we did electricity. We did current and all that stuff. So. So it was right after that we had to leave. Yes. Okay. Right so. You guys talked about the voltage of a battery, right? Or voltage of a cell. That, the voltage is your potential. And I, I, I'm, I think you guys called it that, right? So your potential is measured as a voltage. Now, <laughs> the reason why I'm gonna push that off to the side, yeah. but also related to this, is that in your cell, in this, because you guys are usually pretty much using these big D cell batteries, right, to run the, your um, circuit boards. This is chem this is chemical en potential energy, the form of chemical potential energy. But in this case, <coughs> our chemical potential energy is going to be transferred into electricity. So you have you know your reactant is going to go to product but as a react as a result of that rather than there being a kinetic energy change there's a change in our potential energy that's showing up as an electrical manifesting itself as electrical energy with a lightning what's happening is you get a buildup of electrons either on the cloud or on the ground, and that difference all of a sudden builds up to the point where it can't sustain itself anymore, and then you get your lightning strike. So that's why it's a little bit hard to, to define like that. Yeah. Um, I guess I can do it again. You guys are going to have to move. Over here, you will see what I'm going to do. is so intermingled with the surroundings we can't say it's in this nice neat little package that all the energy change is going to be in there totally separate from our surroundings what I'm doing here is trying to get the point across as to how this energy change is going to be taking place so let's say that I have a chemical reaction in my system this here where we got the reaction occurred so quick that there was no way that energy could transfer between the system and surroundings until it was completely done. Now it's done. Our temperature is down to 23 degrees Celsius. Our surroundings temperature is still at 30 though. And John, you're absolutely right. Now, because they are in contact with each other, they have to exchange energy. One's at a higher temperature than the other one. It's, it's automatic. If you have two things at different temperatures coming in contact with each other, there's going to be a transfer of energy. So I've got 30 degrees for my surroundings, 23 degrees for my system. 
energy is going to move from the surroundings into the system. So the temperature of our surroundings drops. The temperature of our system rises until the two come to equilibrium. Now, we always take the point of view of the system. There's going to be one time in my explanations where I take the point of view of the surroundings simply so we can get back to the point of view of the system. Okay. So our, we always define everything based on the system itself. Well, the reason why we call it endothermic is because in the interaction between the system and surrounding, after that reaction is done and the temperature of that system dropped, energy from the surroundings came in. That's the endothermic part. By itself, by itself, this alone isn't necessarily endothermic or exothermic. By itself, that's just the system. It's its contact with the surroundings that's making it an endothermic process. Can I use Russian? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So the system has to have contact with surroundings to change. Yeah. Or does it, I guess, anyway? Yes. Okay. If it didn't, it's what we would call an isolated system. Yeah. Isolated system means that there is no exchange of energy or matter with the surroundings. And that's purely hypothetical. Kylie? So, exo and endothermic and temperature is only to describe the relationship between the surroundings and the system. JT? So would the surroundings lose heat as well by this? Like because like when it'd be trying to warm up the system. So what well, that is yeah, well it's not that they lose heat. That's where the heat or the change in energy that we call heat comes from. Okay. So that <coughs> movement of energy from the surroundings into the system, that amount of energy is what we call the heat. So in this case, heat is going to flow from the surroundings into the system. So the, the surroundings stays in the system. It, it's always going to be 30 degrees Celsius. No. Okay. That's why the temperature of it dropped. Okay. That, oh. Okay. So your temp. So your the temperature of the higher the the higher temperature is going to drop. The lower temperature is going to rise until you get to that thermal equilibrium. Okay. Now, the reaction I did was exothermic. And we know that because <coughs> the temperature of the room is going to rise. Well, if you think about where the flame was, okay, if you pretend it was kind of contained, the temperature of that area where that flame was was really high because our kinetic energy, our, our potential energy is dropping, our kinetic energy is rising very quickly. Well, that's going to make where the flame is, that's going to make the temperature much higher than what the rest of the room is. With that higher temperature now, the room's going to warm up because the high temperature products, the carbon dioxide and water, that reaction, they're going to cool back down to try and get back to the same temperature as the room, but the room's temperature will have risen somewhat. By doing the reaction the way I did, I raised the temperature of this room a little bit. You gotta remember, for me to raise the temperature of everything in this room, I'd have to raise everything in this room one degree Celsius. And there's a lot of stuff in here. That's why, that's why your parents you know, close the front door in the middle of winter time so that the, 
Heat's not going to escape. Well, it's not the heat. Well, I guess it is the heat escape. Because <laughs> if your house is the system and the surroundings is the outside, and the outside is a lot lower in temperature than it is in the house, leaving a front door open is not the best idea in the world. Because temperature in the house is going to drop, thermostat kicks on, then you're just going to be burning gas to do what? Heat the outside? We do enough that that with our cars and stuff. Right. So in an exothermic reaction, our kinetic energy is rising, our potential energy is lowering, and we get it to see a temperature rise. This is just the system. So that would be just the gas that was burning. When in contact with the surroundings, because, and I'm sorry, my number, I changed my numbers, but I didn't change the, the scale. <coughs> so if my temperature of the uh, system shoots up to 100, whereas before it was at 70, now my, surround, my system's going to cool down and my surroundings is going to warm up. That's why that reaction feels warm to us, because we are part of the surroundings. And that reaction is occurring, releasing energy, producing a temperature well above us. So the energy is coming in to us. But where is it leaving? If it's coming into us, and we're part of the what? We're part of the surroundings. If it's coming into us, it's leaving the system. the system. And that's exothermic. What would be an example of an chemical coal packs. Those ones you smack, you squish around and get cold. You ever seen one? I'll see if the nurse has one. Remind me next time. See if the nurse has one. She can she can get it. Right, so like you know, like the uh, trainers and stuff, they carry them around in their in their in their aid kit. So you smack it and you squish it around and it gets cold. Yeah. It's not as good as an ice pack, but it's, it'll get the job done in a pinch. Right. That's an example of an endothermic reaction. It feels cold because what's happening is the temperature of that system, the chemical reaction inside the pack, is dropping significantly. So the system is releasing heat into the surrounding? No. The system is going to end up absorbing heat from the surroundings. But then why is it cooling? Because if if the if the surroundings is putting heat into that system, what's going to happen to the temperature of the surroundings if heat's leaving? It's going to get colder. That's why.
about nap time. I said it's about nap time. Should have been an artist. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Shouldn't I? I? Should be teaching art class. <laughs> You're coming for Mr. Jones' job. That's my ice cube in a hand. <laughs> How does the ice cube feel? Oh. Why? Because there is a temperature difference. <coughs> what is it doing as it's sitting in your hand, though? Well, it's it, it, acquiring more. Not really. So, the misconception is, is that as it melts, it's warming up, but it's not. As it's melting, the temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. So, even in your hand, the ice itself is still at 0 degrees Celsius. Now, once it's melted, it can raise the temperature. But, <coughs> At the molecular level, what you've got going on is you've got water molecules in the ice are really strongly attracted to each other. And what you're trying to, what you're doing when you're melting it is you're breaking that attraction and allowing the water molecules to start sliding past each other. So that's endothermic in the sense that energy is going to go into breaking that bond. Now, the only problem with that example is that that example relies on the potential energy based on phase. And that's not what we're focused on. We're focused on the potential energy based on the, uh, uh, the chemical potential energy. So, um, just think of the reaction that involved in the phase change. See, I can't remember what the reaction is that occurs in the um, cold pack. Oh, I know why. You can do the, you might be able to register this at home. So if I took some sodium chloride table salt and put it into a beaker, where that sodium chloride is going to go from solid to aqueous. And what you would find is that if you stuck a thermometer down in there, as you put that table salt in there, you're going to see a drop in the temperature. Because what's happening is that the sodium chloride, if this is our system, our kinetic energy is dropping and our potential energy is increasing. So that's an example of where you would have an endothermic reaction or process that's a chemical process. It doesn't seem like it because you're just dissolving the sodium chloride, but 
you know, you could argue that it is a chemical process and that you're breaking apart the attraction between the sodium and the chloride in the solid. So we kept it as just chemical equations wise, chemical reactions that are endothermic. We're kind of limited as to what we have that you're familiar with. Because nature favors reactions that are exothermic. Not saying that it's not going to, you know, that reactions that are endothermic can't happen. Nature favors exothermic processes. There's more going on. That's what we're going to cover second semester. Questions? We talked about heat. I don't need to, do to explain this very much. State direction. So when we talk about a reaction being exothermic or endothermic, we will assign a, we, we give it a sign associated with the numerical value for the energy change. Q is a symbol for heat. So if Q is positive, meaning heat is flowing into the system, that is an endothermic process. If Q is negative, meaning energy uh, heat is leaving the system, that is an exothermic process. The methane burning was an exothermic process. Questions? For some reason, I think I deleted something off that last bullet point, and I can't remember what it is. <coughs> but for our state functions, a state function describes the condition of a system. Mass, temperature, and volume are examples of state properties or state functions. But the next thing is really important. A state property or state function must be contained or part of the system. So mass is part of the system because it's the matter that makes it up. Temperature, it's the velocities, the average kinetic energy that those atoms and molecules have that are in that system. The volume, how much space are they taking up? That's part of that system. What's not part of the system that we just talked about? What? Surrounding? No, well, uh, yeah, the surrounding is not part of the system, but. <laughs> heat. Heat. Heat's not in the system. Where does heat occur? when it transfers. So it's not in the system, it's not in the surroundings, it only occurs when you are transferring energy from one system to the surroundings. Which <coughs> means heat's not a state property. The other thing, it can be measured at an instant in time. Heat cannot be measured at an instant in time. Heat's measured over time. How much energy over time got transferred? We don't have to measure over time what the mass is. We can measure the mass right now. Same thing with temperature, same thing with volume. We can't measure heat right now because a system or surroundings doesn't contain heat. We can measure the temperature, which will tell us about the kinetic energy that that system or surroundings has, but it's not gonna tell us about the heat.
if you have a change in state, your change in that value is going to be the final minus initial. It's kind of like with the temperature, the delta T. The change in temperature is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Your change in mass would be the final mass minus the initial mass. Your change in volume. Math's not a good, well, who, I guess math. Who had math last period? During lunch. Who had uh, a foreign language? What'd you have? French. So you're up in the, you got, you got one of the new classrooms then, right? Yep. How did you get here? Uh, I went down the staircase over by Mr. Dice's room, and then went down that hallway to the main staircase in the middle of the school bus cafeteria. Uh, okay. No, I got it. And then you came, then where? Then down that hallway over there. Uh, your room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who would have taken a different, who would have taken a different path? Levi? Um, I probably would have gone down the math hallway, down like the staircase that goes down two floors. And then I would have gone down this hallway and then the room. Like the end of the math hallway. Like I wouldn't go through the math hallway. Like where the key stuff classes are? Yeah, like where the yeah. The key stuff, yeah. Oh, okay. With yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. business, yeah. business, business. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Let's get through the area where the main So. If Levi and JT started at the same point, they ended here at the same point in the room, does it matter what path they took? And see, that's what, that's what we're talking about with these state functions. It doesn't matter what path it takes. The state function just depends on where did you start and where do you end. Heat may depend on what path you take. In physics, work depended on what, how you did it, right? You may take more work in one situation than another. <coughs> work, by the way, is not a state function. Because you can't contain work. A system can't contain work. All right. New term, enthalpy. The only people I think that would have been introduced to enthalpy is if you had AP biology. Do you remember that term? So you talked about enthalpy when you talked about the um, respiration, ADP, ATP, and all the, what the Krebs cycle. You guys are looking at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> Or you're looking at me like, I remember it, but I don't remember it. <laughs> Bingo. Okay. So, <coughs> enthalpy is one of the, it, enthalpy is, has a very specific definition. It's one of those things in science that it's kind of hard to explain. Um, so, I'm just going to simply say that it's the total amount of energy in the system. Now, if you go back to the first slide or second slide, I had, no, second slide. I think the last bullet was the internal energy is the total amount of kinetic and potential energy, right? Well, this one takes it a step further because potential and kinetic energy are only one, two types of many types of energy. Enthalpy is all the different types of energy. The, energy due to the attractions and repulsions, the energy due to the arrangement of the electrons, the nuclear energy that's in the atom. Enthalpy is one of those things, like the total kinetic energy, enthalpy is one of those things we cannot know. For most of the systems that we're dealing with, we cannot know 
what the enthalpy is because the systems are just too complex. So to save time, I remember the number from last period. In this bottle, I have about 1.7 times 10 to the 25th water molecules. That's a lot of molecules, right? Uh, give or take a couple trillion. Because a trillion's nothing compared to that number. So when we talk about our enthalpy, if I wanted to know what the enthalpy was in this bottle, I would need to know what's the position, the arrangement, the orientation, the kinetic energy of every single one of those molecules. And that's just too many. We can't do it. I seem to recall a paper reading some uh, a report about enthalpy and measuring it for um, idealized systems where they were using supercomputers to, you know, measure or estimate enthalpy values for systems that had maybe a hundred to a thousand molecules. And that's pushing it with a supercomputer. Okay. So <clears throat> what use is it? Well, it has all kinds of use for us. Our heat is our enthalpy change. If we define or if we narrow down and, and, and carry out the experiment in a well-defined manner, we can measure the change in enthalpy. No, we may not be able to know what the enthalpy is at a specific point in time, but we can still measure the change in the enthalpy. <coughs> at constant pressure, that's important, at constant pressure, the heat of the reaction is our change in the enthalpy of the system. Why constant pressure? Let me do an example. <coughs> if, and this is why we don't use gases. So I'm going to set this to 90 milliliters. Not a random amount. I'm trying to make the math easy so you can do it in your heads. If I have two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule, all of them gases, and I've got 60 milliliters and I've got 30 milliliters, how many milliliters of water will I form if I measure it at the same temperature and pressure. I got 90 milliliters. 60 of it is hydrogen, 30 of it is oxygen. How many milliliters of water will I form? 90. Not 90. Covered this last time in lecture. <laughs> you guys are just throwing out numbers now. Somebody give me a value and have, be able to support why you say it. Andrew? 60. Why? Because of the boring field. Explain. There are two moles of hydrogen and there are two moles of water. So if I've got a two to two ratio, 60 milliliters, 60 milliliters. And this is the only gas, right? So here's the problem. It's why we don't like gases. Okay, so as long as we don't have gases involved, we're good. Because if I, if I went from 90 milliliters to 60 milliliters,
What did I have to do? Okay, what else happened though? Well, the pressure can be staying the same. Kylie? Change the volume. I changed the volume, meaning I had to do what with that piston? What's that? Compress it. Well, I took this off so I wouldn't have to compress it. Because I want it still at the same pressure. But I had to do what? I had to take it from 90 to 60. What do I have to do to that syringe? What do I have to do with the plunger? What do I have to do with the piston? Whatever you want to call it. Your physics teachers were very disappointed in you guys. I had to move it. Change the final position. Displace which it. means I had to do what? Displace it. Which means I had to do what? It's warm the position. Like apply energy. energy. Andrew? Work. I had to do work. <laughs> <laughs> right? Work equals force times distance, correct? I had to apply a force, I had to move it a distance. You didn't think it was going to physics class today, did you? <coughs> the reason why this equation works if we keep at constant pressure and we don't have gases is because our enthalpy change technically is defined as the heat and work done. If we don't have gases, we don't have volume changes. If we don't have volume changes, we don't have work. We're chemists. We don't want to work. No work for us. Okay? So, that's why I said if you, if you, make, if you set up the experiment in a very specific way and you eliminate things that you don't want to worry with, like work, we can say that. Our heat is our enthalpy change. The other one up that I don't have up here, but it's not that big of a deal, is if you're at a constant volume. <coughs> but that's beyond what the, the detail that we need to go into. Our enthalpy change is products minus reactants. Again, final minus initial. Our heat is going to tell us what our enthalpy change is. So if all we have to do is measure our temperature change, then we can measure what our enthalpy change is. And our signs are assigned the same way. If delta H is negative, it's exothermic. If delta H is positive, it's endothermic. Okay, enthalpy is an extensive property. What an extensive property means is that it depends on how much material you have. It's kind of in that. Depends on the amount of matter. Add this to your notes someplace. Intensive. There's two different types of properties, intensive and extensive. Extensive depends on the amount of material. Intensive is the opposite. An intensive property is independent of the amount of material. Can somebody give me an example of an in of an extensive property besides enthalpy because that's the definition up there. A measurement that depends on how much material you have. Matul? Pressure? Pressure, no. Because I can have a lot of material at the same pressure as a, as a, I can have a whole lot of gas at the same pressure as a little bit of gas. Cameron? Volume, that would be an extensive property. Mass. Mass would be an extensive property. What else? Kinetic energy. Okay, I want to make 
make sure we're clear about what kinetic energy, not the average, but the total amount of kinetic energy. Okay? So if I were to add up all of the kinetic energies of all the particles in here, that would depend on how much material I've got. Okay. What would be an intensive property? Something that does not depend on the amount of material that you have. Pressure. Pressure. <laughs> Pre I was going to say pressure. <laughs> it does, it's, it's a, a property that does not depend on how much material you have. So you can have a lot or you can have a little. The property is going to have the same value. Don, did you raise your hand for an instant there? I did, but I don't think it's right. Try it. Volume. Well, we already had that. Yeah, I know. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's an intensive property. <coughs> Irving? Density. Density is an intensive property. It doesn't matter how much you have. You have a tiny amount or a large amount, density is going to be the same. Temperature? Temperature would be, yeah, temperature would be an intensive property. It doesn't matter how much you have. So I could have. <coughs> Uh, five gallons of water that's boiling, it's going to be 100 degrees Celsius. I could have five milliliters of water boiling, it's 100 degrees Celsius. Any questions about intensive, extensive? <coughs> okay, so chemical equations. Uh, they're calling them thermochemical equations. Just a chemical equation telling you how much energy is going to be absorbed or released. Uh, so what this is telling us is that in this reaction, as re if I have one mole of hydrogen, one mole of chlorine, and two moles of producing two moles of hydrogen chloride, it would re <coughs> release 185 kilojoules of energy. Release because it's positive. It's an exothermic reaction. <coughs> if it was positive. It would be endothermic, and that's the amount of energy that would be absorbed. Um, delta H does depend on the states of material. So we've got to pay attention to whether we have a liquid or a gas or a solid. Um, you're going to run into these terms, heat of vaporization or enthalpy of vaporization, either one, they mean the same thing. So the enthalpy of vaporization is going from a liquid to a gas. That's going to be a positive value because you're going from a liquid to a gas. Going from a gas to a liquid would be the exact same value, only negative. Solid going to a liquid or melting is called the heat of fusion or enthalpy of fusion. <coughs> we can use this as a conversion factor to help do calculations. We do want to make sure that all the values are measured at the same temperature and pressure. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to just walk you through this question here real quick because there's a couple things I want to go over before you leave. So first step in the industrial recovery of zinc from the zinc sulfide ores roasting, that is conversion of zinc sulfide and zinc oxide by heating. Basically they're burning it, but they're controlling it. So there is your reaction. It tells you that that reaction is going to release 879 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the heat evolved. Does anybody have any question about what evolved means? Yes. Does evolve and change? Yeah, but it also it implies a direction. Does it mean it's from reacting to product? No. Kyla? Is it synonymous with release? Yes. So evolved means it's released or given off. So calculate heat evolved, given off in kilojoules per gram of zinc sulfide roasted. Basically saying, 
you got a gram of zinc sulfide, how much energy is going to be released when it undergoes that, that roasting process or combustion? So you start off normal. If you're ever given grams, you always have to get it to moles. That's your first step always. How did you know it was one gram? Huh? How did you know it was one gram? Per. Per means one. That's a hard question because you got two terms in there that are throwing you off. One's evolved, and then the other one's the per gram. Because they don't give you a number, but it's one. Now, when you're solving, once you got to the moles, there's two moles of zinc sulfide in that reaction, right? For each two moles, how much? So if I have two moles of zinc sulfide in this reaction, that's how much energy is going to be released. So basically, we just we simply use that numerical value in the kilojoules and treat the numerical value as if it were a coefficient and the unit of kilojoules as if it were a formula. That's all there is to it. The tool? So what you did was you had the two moles of uh, zinc sulfide and the enthalpy was negative 879 kilojoules, so you just used that as a conversion? Yep, that's it. So your, that, that, and we could use this for any of them. If we were dealing with oxygen, it would be this many kilojoules for every three moles of oxygen. This much energy for every two moles of zinc oxide. This much energy for each two moles of sulfur dioxide. <coughs> Questions? Yes? If you were to like convert the kilojoules to all of the reactions and products, should the number equal each other? So if you convert it to zinc sulfide and then add it to the oxygen? No, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no, I, I just, so, because what this is saying, this is the amount of energy that's released when oh, okay. this whole thing takes place. Okay. So what, I, I understand what you're asking about, but it doesn't make it, it doesn't make sense with how this is interpreted. Okay. So this is this is interpreted as the energy released for when this entire process takes place. Okay. The entire process and how we use. Um, I was going to say, can we use oxygen? Yes. Now, that's going to change because, so if we did it per gram of oxygen, that's going to be a different value because, first of all, a gram of oxygen doesn't weigh as much as the zinc sulfide does. So that's a little bit harder to look at in terms of grams, but if we were thinking of it as moles, mole proportions, for each mole of zinc sulfide, I'm going to make sure I do this right in my head. So for each mole of zinc sulfide, you would get <coughs> more energy than a mole of oxygen. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, the next one on there is another one just like that. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to do it. <coughs> We're going to pick up there next time with calorimetry. Here's what you need to do for Friday. If you go into the modules, in Canvas. It's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think I need to give you too much detail. But 
Uh, in the module for this unit two is the virtual uh, molar mass of an unknown gas. I have the document linked to that's in drive. Here's a video of me explaining the experiment and conducting it. This is the data that I collected that you're going to use as if you collected it. The calculations and analysis are in the document that you're for the lab. And then I've got an additional analysis that you need to answer. At the very bottom is a link <coughs> to the assignment. But you can get to that through your calendar as well as your to-do list, where you upload a PDF of the calculations and analysis stuff. You're going to have to calculate the molar mass of each one of these trials. I'm going to tell you to show me the work for one set. So I would tell you, show me the work for gas one, trial one, and how you get to that for the molar mass, and then simply give me the answers for the other five. I don't need to see you set it up five times or six times. If you know how to do it the first time, it's done the exact same way the other five. It's due Friday. Okay? If you've got questions about it as the week goes on, by all means, please ask.